Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. I'm happy to be in the house of God today. As many of you know, Friday night, uh, we lost Muhammad Ali. Saturday night, we lost Elder C.D. Brooks. May God bless that mighty man of God. And I'm reminded of a story of Muhammad Ali was on an airplane one day, and the flight attendant was trying to get him to put on his seatbelt, but he wouldn't put on his seatbelt. Plane took off, he, he wouldn't put on his seatbelt. Finally, she said, Mr. Ali, you're going to have to put on your seatbelt. He said, I don't need no seatbelt. Don't you know I'm Superman? <laughs> she said, Mr. Ali, if you were Superman, you wouldn't need a plane. Put on your seatbelt. <laughs> I have been on an airplane once or twice a week for about 35, almost 40 years, every single week. Four million miles on Delta alone. And that does something to your back after a while. But I was telling your president, I had a surgical procedure in the morning and walked out of the hospital that afternoon. Praise the Lord. Now, you know, that's God. I want to share a few remarks before I share a song. My wife, Linda, and I consider it a real honor and privilege to be here for the South Central Conference Camp Meeting 2016. You have embraced us as part of your family, and we thank you for your warmth and your generosity. Now, some of you know I love researching and studying history. I love history. In my research this year, I came upon this true story about a young boy born into slavery in 1855 in Richmond, Virginia. At the end of the Civil War in 1865, this 10-year-old boy, now free, somehow got separated from his family. Miraculously, this little boy made his way across the country almost 3,000 miles to the booming town of Reno, Nevada. At the age of 23, he heard about an evangelist holding some meetings by the name of John Loughborough. He decided to attend the meetings, and on July the 30th, 1878, he heard a lady speak at that meeting. Her name was Ellen White. This young man accepted the Sabbath, became one of the first Adventist church members in Reno, Nevada. He was such an impressive, Christ-like young man, they made him church clerk. But now fast forward 11 years later, on October the 5th, 1889, that same young black man became the first black ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. And five of the first churches he pastored was right here in the South Central Conference. He pastored in Edgefield Junction, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Bowling Green, he started the first black Adventist church in Nashville, Tennessee. His name is Charles Kinney. Today, we know him as the founder of black Adventism. So that means, brothers and sisters, historically speaking, this conference is the cradle of black Adventism.
historically speaking, every black Adventist church in America can trace its beginnings and its roots back to the South Central Conference. This conference was also the cradle of the beginning of my own ministry. The first real official sermon I ever preached was in the Hillcrest Church in Nashville. It was around, around 1975. I, I remember it was such a big deal that my girlfriend, now my wife at the time, went out and bought me a brand new Don Robbie suit. She said, you preaching at Hillcrest on Sabbath? Boy, you got to look good. And so she retired my plaid pants and suits, my platform shoes, and my bell-bottom pants. <laughs> it was a big improvement, amen. I want you to know God blessed me with a godly wife who travels with me everywhere I go. Last year, about a year ago, we were between August and November, we were on six continents together. She goes with me everywhere I go. As a matter of fact, we were going through TSA not long ago, and the TSA agent pulled her to the side and said, ma'am, do you have something sharp in your luggage? She said, I, I don't think so. He said, come with me, please. He pulled her to the side, and he opened up her luggage. The first thing that came out was a Bible. And she said, oh, yes, I did forget. The Lord said his word is sharper than a two-edged sword. Thank God for a godly wife. It was, it was at Hillcrest that Sabbath morning that I first experienced what I would later on understand was the anointing of God. As I came down off the rostrum, I felt like God's hand was placed around me and God was speaking to me saying, son, you did what I wanted you to do. Since that moment, uh, it has been an awesome experience serving God. Do you know the first week of prayer I ever conducted was in Bessemer, Alabama. And it was in this conference that I dedicated my life and ministry to Christ. And from that moment, I knew that as long as I lived, I'm going to hold a song till the end of the sermon today. I knew as long as I lived, I could never get enough of the stories of Jesus. It was Fanny Crosby who wrote that heavenly hymn, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Right on my heart, every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. I don't know about you, but the stories of Jesus, they are food to my hungry soul. You can never tell me enough of how he turned water into wine. You can never tell me enough of how demons tremble at the sound of his voice. You can never tell me enough how they cower in fear at the name, the mere mention of his name. You can never tell me enough of how he restored withered limbs and healed the leper's spots. You can never tell me enough of how crippled souls threw their crutches away how the crippled left Jesus running and skipping and praising God. You can never tell me enough of how he opened the blinded eyes with the touch of his finger or how he fed 5,000 with a few fish 
and of loaves of bread. You can never tell me enough how he healed without cost. How he walked on water like a pedestrian on a city street. You can never tell me enough of how he spoke with eloquence to his enemies and holy boldness to his friends. You can never tell me enough of how he spoke peace to a raging storm and how pompous, pretentious waves would lay down when he said, shh. You can never tell me enough of how in a few short three years he accomplished a lifetime of ministry. You, you can never tell me enough of how he confounded the Pharisees and left them baffled and despairing. And now today, after almost 40 years, as an Adventist preacher, singing thousands of songs, preaching thousands of sermons, and traveling millions of miles, I never tire of telling the world that Jesus lives. As I told you, I traveled more than four million miles on Delta, and one day I sat down at my desk and opened a book, and before I knew it, I reached for my seatbelt. I heard an old black preacher say one day, someone said to him, all that traveling, don't you get tired? He said, oh yeah, he said, sometimes I get tired. He said, but you know what? It's still better than picking cotton. When your president, Elder Edmonds, asked me, called about a year ago as an organized man and asked if I would speak for your camp meeting, I was honored and humbled. This is an historic camp meeting, 70 years of ministry. I asked Elder Edmonds what would be the theme of the encampment, and he told me the theme will be at the cross. Now, to preach on this theme is a difficult one for this preacher. Not because you feel like you're preaching on a topic everybody has heard before. And a topic everybody already knows everything possible there is to know about. But for me, the older I get, the more difficult it is for me to preach about the cross and not get emotional. Not because of the gruesome details of the suffering Christ endured, but because I can no longer preach on the cross without becoming overwhelmed and overcome by how much God really loves us. I am awed that in all the wide sweep of history, few names carry with them the mystery, the glory, the grandeur of that name, Calvary. You don't understand. But angels breathe that name in awe. Calvary. They speak its syllables in adoration and praise. Calvary the scene of the grandest battle ever fought by heaven's undisputed champion, the sovereign monarch of the universe, Calvary, a unique spiritual event unlike any other in history, where sinners are redeemed from the rule of death and men are ransomed from the power of the grave. Calvary, it is a mystery to angelic hosts a mighty blow to rebellious causes. When the choirs of earth sing of Calvary, angels, hosts, listen, tune their hearts to hear our praise. And they strain their hearts to understand what kind of love is this? That would fall in love with the undeserving. What kind of love is this? The 
that is never disheartened by the plight of the unworthy. What kind of love is this that draws near in spite of our apathy? What kind of love is this that finds affection with those mired in shame and disgrace? What kind of love is this that finds a way to trust those who cannot be trusted? What kind of love is this that remains undaunted by treachery and faithful in the face of broken promises? What kind of love would authorize such a sacrifice? That name Calvary should fall from our lips with the profoundest of honor, the deepest of reverence. In the wide sweep of history, it is without parallel heaven's greatest risk and God's costliest sacrifice throughout eternity the cross of Calvary will testify to the inestimable value of every human soul it meets the emergency of every sin the need of every sinner and planted by heaven in the soil of Calvary was a battered, brutish, cruel cross. Someone said it was tall enough to reach the portals of heaven, broad enough to span sin's divide. The only answer for the fears and anxieties of man and on its hinges opens the door of eternity. And so this morning, pray with me. Pray for me as I linger while just to think and glory in the cross. Come with me, push through the rude and railing mob, push past the contemptuous withering throng, look past the Sanhedrin who saw him as a deceiver and a false prophet, look past the priests from the ecclesiastical court, and this morning I want you to see Jesus at the cross, but not through the eyes of the jeering mob who hurled their obscenities at him, not through the eyes of those who mocked and ridiculed him along the road of sorrows, not through the eyes of the callous soldiers or the heartless priests. Today I want you to see Jesus through the eyes of a nameless, convicted felon. A forlorn, forgotten thief. I want you to see Jesus through criminal eyes. A man tried and condemned. An outlaw, a robber, a thief. See Jesus this morning through the eyes of a man who had wasted his potential, squandered his years as a thief. If you have your Bibles, you can look with me. Luke 23, verse 39. The book of Luke chapter 23 verse 39, the word of God says, and one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him saying, if thou be the Christ, say thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me. In paradise like most men the thief on the cross did not come here a hardened correct criminal he became one no mother raises a child with a criminal career in their future he had been led astray by bad company wrongfully influenced by evil companions you know 
as parents trying to raise godly children in an ungodly world, I often tell the, the Lord, this is not a fair fight. We live in a world where children no longer have to go looking for evil. Evil is looking for them. No longer do we have to go looking for murderers and rapists. They are now welcomed into our homes through devices that fit into the palm of our hands. I tell God, this is not a fair fight. I, I, I call the smartphone digital idolatry. One definition of idolatry is the extreme devotion to something you try to take a cell phone from somebody for a day talk about separation anxiety we wake with it sleep with it go to the bathroom with it where I live I attend a, a morning Bible study on Tuesday mornings and a young man was there one day and he decided to give us his testimony he said uh, uh, my wife and I were lying in the bed the other night and we were texting each other. He said, I text her, are you in the mood? And she texted me back, no. Some things don't change. It's become the new way for couples to fight. You know what I'm talking about. You fight and text to each other. Digital idolatry. I tell the Lord that as fast as we are making deposits of common sense and character in the hearts and minds of our children, as fast as we're making deposits of Bible principles and faith and virtue, there's a degenerate culture in the palm of their hands making silent withdrawals faster than we're making deposits and today kids even from good homes are coming up bankrupt brothers and sisters this young man dying on the cross next to jesus had been influenced by his wicked friends taking a wrong path he had made some of the common mistakes of youth and was not caught up in a vicious cycle of criminal activity uh, you heard the president mention for the past 20 years, my message, my ministry has had a central focus. The children of those whose parents are incarcerated. The children of those who are in prison. In those years we have invested, those last 20 years, we've invested over 50 million dollars in the lives of children who live in disadvantaged communities in America. And I can tell you firsthand, that when our black boys get involved and caught up in the criminal justice system, even if they are innocent, once you're in the justice system, it seems that there's no way out. Once you're in it, it is not easy to escape the clutches or scrutiny, are you listening to me, of the criminal justice system. As a matter of fact, you have a greater chance of getting stuck in the criminal justice system than getting into it in the first place. This young man was raised in a Sabbath keeping home where the laws of God were taught and memorized. He carried in his heart memories of songs and scriptures that haunted his spirit and troubled his conscience. He carried in his heart memories of a praying mother but because his faith was not a personal experiential transformative faith he allowed himself to be swayed by the moral objections of others I want you to know faith that does not transform us does little good for us God says say it again faith that does not, that does not transform us does little good for us Faith that does not transform us into the image and character of God is worthless to us. Sabbath keeping that does not transform and change us is a waste. 
of God's precious time. This young man stifled the voice of conscience. Life became a slippery path and soon many around him, even from his own family, gave up on him. They saw him as incorrigible. Hey, you got a child like that. Seem like he's beyond hope. Beyond redemption. Too late for his heart to be touched by the light and mercies of heaven. His fortunes ran out. He was caught, arrested, tried, and condemned. And I want you to know something. For your own good, sometimes God will arrest you. Somebody hand me that handkerchief. I'm going to sweat my preaching out this morning. God will apprehend you and hinder you. Sometimes God will detain you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I met some men in prison who will tell you that God, had God not arrested them, they wouldn't be alive today. My friend Barry Black, some of his friends said, this guy down the street owes us some money. Let's go beat him up. He said, oh, no, you all go. They found the guy, beat him to death. All of them were sentenced to life in prison, except Barry Black who didn't go that day. Sometimes God will arrest you. That door you were trying to break in wouldn't open. <laughs> that gun you tried to fire jam was God. And now you're living for Jesus under voluntary house arrest. <laughs> Hallelujah. Young people, you will always get into trouble when you think too much of what people are thinking and saying about you. Most of the time, they're not even thinking about you anyway. One day, God pulled me aside in ministry. He pulled me aside and said, son, you have developed an inordinate need. A need I never ordained for you. You've developed an inordinate need for the affirmation and approbation of those who won't lose a night's sleep if you croaked. So now here he is, some mother's son on death row, about to be executed on a cross for his crimes. But lo and behold, what destiny, the place of his execution is Calvary. Out of all the places he could die, he's dying next to Jesus. He listens as Jesus prays for those who are persecuting him. And he lifts his head, looks into the face of Jesus, but, but he's able to see beyond his cold, pale lips. He, he's able to see beyond the thorns and his bruised and wounded side. He sees the soldiers gambling over the robe, but he sees nobility, goodness of character. He sees the light of a savior shining in his eyes and that young thief dying on the cross looks again and the Bible tells us that everybody grows silent they turn with curious eyes and listen with curious ears because a conversation is passing between these two men dying on a cross the conviction comes to his soul he is my hope. And with his life slipping away, probation about to close, despair sweeping over him. This young man remembers, this is the same, this is the same Jesus who healed the leper. This is the same Jesus who caused the lame to walk and the blind to see. This is the same Jesus who raised 
Lazarus. And they're hanging on that cross. In the mind of that young man, a chain of faith fills his heart. Evidence comes together. Hope like a kindling revives. And he sees the last appeal from God to his dying soul. His lips trembling with pain and anguish. That young criminal thief understands the one most important truth this world will ever know. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and the young thief sees in Jesus the help of the helpless one who comforts when all comforts flee and behind him he sees a wasted life before him he sees a hollow tomb but there on Calvary that young man gathers together the shattered pieces of his fragmented chaotic confused light and in that last prayer, he prays a prayer of faith. He turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into the kingdom. The Bible tells us that the answer comes back from the lips of Jesus, soft and melodious, truly, verily, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. I will remember you. He knew Jesus was saying, my son, from death row, the next face you will see is mine. From death row, you will graduate to paradise. From death row, you will stand on the sea of glass from are oh, you not listening to me today from death row you will eat from the tree of life from death row you will walk with angels sing in angelic choruses from death row you will stand where seraphims veil their faces from death row you will hear cherubims cry out holy holy Lord God Almighty, from death row, you will see the face of the Father and praise him in the firmament of the heavens. Oh, years ago, church, I had a friend, like a, a, a Republican congressman, and yes, I have Republican friends. I sing for Republicans and Democrats. One day I sang for a big function where President Clinton spoke. And the same night I had to rush across town and sing at this big Republican function. And when I got there, I announced I had just come from singing for the President of the United States. And there was a boo that went through the audience. And I said, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, I always go where people really need the Lord. And there was this polite applause. And then I said, and that's why I'm here. Anybody here knows Hillary Clinton needs Jesus? Anybody here knows that Donald Trump needs Jesus? And if the truth be told, we all need Jesus because we all are thieves. Spiritually, we are thieves. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, we all are thieves. And that day on Calvary, Christ gave to all men the same promise. You will be with me. Before I leave you, I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that Jesus' death on the cross was for a trinity of purpose. One, Jesus died to ransom and redeem. Two, Jesus died to rescue from Satan's power. And three, Jesus died so we could have the power to be recreated and restored into the image and character of God. Too many of us 
are glad to be ransomed and redeemed. We are glad to be rescued from Satan's power. But we don't sit long enough with Jesus to let him recreate us and restore, you listening to me? Restore us into the image and character of God. The cross is also God's answer. Did you know Jesus came here to defend the character of his father? You see, Satan had impeach. You know what that word impeach means? It, impeach means to indict. To accuse Satan impeached and impugned the character of God put God on trial charge God with lying and false misrepresentation the devil said you are not what you say you are you're a God of hate and not a God of love uh, there's no there's no drama like a leader on trial some of us lived through the impeachment proceedings of President Nixon and Clinton, and I, and I was part of the, that, th those experiences. I'll have to tell you about it later on. But in heaven, Satan dared to impeach God and demand that God relinquish his position and authority in the universe and share his sovereignty with others like himself. Ellen White says, stay away from negative people. You know what she says? She says, their envy and jealousy has a power to paralyze your ability to reason. That's what happened to a third of the angels who got thrown out of heaven. Envy and jealousy <laughs> paralyzed their reason. The, the, the devil has blamed God for all the evil that's in the world. You talk about throwing a rock and hiding your hand. He causes death and disease and then puts God on trial for the evil he has done. I read about this, I couldn't believe it. In 2007, after seeing hundreds of tornadoes hit his state, State Senator Ernie Chambers of Nebraska filed a lawsuit against God seeking a permanent injunction against God's harmful activities. And I love this, the suit, the, the, the suit, the lawsuit went all the way to the Nebraska Supreme Court where it was finally thrown out, dismissed because God could not be properly notified because he has an unlisted home address. The devil has accused and impeached the character of God. The devil says God is a tyrant, he's a bully, he's charged God with lying, misrepresent. He said to Eve, to Eve in the Garden of Eden, you don't know God like I know him. He has a character problem. He doesn't always tell the truth. You won't really die. Satan demanded that God relinquish his authority, but because the devil can't find, and my son gave me this, and I thank God for children. This, because the devil can't find wicked traits in God, he has to look in the mirror. And the wicked things he sees in his own character, he uses to create a false picture of God. So he's charged God with preparing an eternally burning hell for everybody who disagrees with him. But thank God the cross says not guilty. My God is not in the torture business. The devil says God can't wait to punish man. But the cross says not guilty. The devil says God created sin. The cross says not guilty. He was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes somebody say with his stripes we are healed the devil says god created cancer the cross says not guilty i read this did you know those of you in the medical profession the servant of the lord tells us i got some doctor friends here the servant of the lord tells us that satan is the originator of disease 
and doctors who are in the fight against disease are in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan himself. Every nurse in here, you are in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil himself. The devil says God causes floods, tornadoes, earthquakes. He has us calling them acts of God. The cross says not guilty. The devil says God's character is unjust and unfair. The cross says, come on, what does the cross say? The devil says that God is the author of suffering, misery, and sin. The cross says, not guilty let no man say when he is tempted i am tempted of god for god cannot be tempted with evil neither tempteth he any man the cross says not guilty the devil says god's character is defective he says god is self-absorbed and self-centered the cross says not guilty the, the devil says god is severe tyrannical demanding inflexible the cross says for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die but god commendeth his love to us that while we were yet sinners christ died for us cross says not guilty the devil says God is running the biggest spy agency in the universe. He's spying on every move you make, watching for every mistake. He can't wait to whack you when you get out of line. But the cross says, no, no. The devil has accused God of finding delight in punishing us with cruel discipline. The cross says, if we confess, Our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what cleanse us from all unrighteousness the devil has charged God with being hard-hearted and unsympathetic and cruel the cross says not guilty and sometimes when men look at Christians and see how we treat each other they blame God for the cruelty of Christian people there are some people who are not in the church today because Ellen White says, beside their name in heaven is written the word cruel. Did you know that many Christian pastors in the South, the pastors owned slaves? I, I, I read recently where in 1838, Georgetown University almost had to close their doors, but the university was saved when the priest who ran the university sold 272 of their slaves. That's how Georgetown University was saved. Don't lay that on God. The priest, as a matter of fact, Frederick Douglass, one said the most devout Christians made the most savage slaveholders. Oh, but the reason, before I close, the reason black people are Christians today is because when slave owners told our forefathers that slavery was God's doing, The slave was able to look at Jesus on the cross and they knew the cross was God's way of saying, not guilty. The devil has brought charges against God. He's convinced people that God torments. But before I leave you, you know what the servant of the Lord says? And I got to read you this. The reason why it seems so difficult to win souls for Christ is that Satan is continually engaged in misrepresenting the character of God to the human mind. The servant of the Lord says that there are men and women in the church who beside their names in the books of heaven is written the word, one word, she says, one word, cruel. She says one of the ways Satan seeks to pervert Christianity is by filling the hearts of church members with his own satanic attributes. 
She said, there are many names registered on the church books by the church clerk that are not written in the Lamb's book of life. The son law says, the character and disposition of Christ's followers will be like Jesus. He is your pattern. He would have you learn by walk by faith. And, and, I, and I gotta tell you this, God gave me this, and I gotta tell you this, if the thief dying on the cross had somehow miraculously lived, and went back to being a thief in spite of the promise from Jesus he would be lost did you hear what I just said because all God's promises are conditional and the thief dying on the cross was saved because he was given the righteousness of Christ as credit for the journey he would have traveled had he lived. He was given the righteousness of Christ as credit that he was headed in the right direction and would have met the conditions that came with the promise of paradise. God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. In other words, I will save who I want to save and as none of y'all, how the young people say, none of y'all it's my business who I say. Had the thief lived, had the thief lived, he would have had to study the word and grow in grace every day to more resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of Jesus. You see, with all of us, there is a gap between who we are and who we were created to be. We were created to resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of God. And it's time to close the gap between who we really are and what God has called us to be. Amen, are you with me today? One day we will hear the Lord say, if we will close that gap, come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom I prepared for you. Before I leave you, I wanna tell you, all of us can pray that prayer every day. If the thief had lived, he would have had to pray that prayer every day Lord remember me some years ago God gave me a song I'm gonna close with this song listen to the message in the song praise the name of God hallelujah somebody say hallelujah hallelujah lay dying on a cross and he knew all along that he had done wrong and now for his sin he must die but as he turned he saw the Christ with his blood flowing down he knew he had found the one who could save his soul so he cried remember me when you come into your kingdom alone remember me when you talk to your father and tell him that I know I've not been 
all he wants me to be but in mercy now i pray lord please remember me then jesus said have no fear Son, you shall be with me eternally. It is for you that I die. And now I know Christ, he lives again. And he stands all alone before the white throne with his own righteous life he covers mine so now I cry remember me when you come into your kingdom oh Lord remember me when you talk to your father and tell him that I know I've not been all he wants me to be but in mercy now i plead lord please remember me remember me when you come into your kingdom oh lord remember me when you talk to your father and tell him that I know I've not been all he wants me to be but in mercy now I plead Lord please remember me remember Remember me, Lord, won't you please remember me? Will you bow your heads with me? everyone who has failed the Lord. Dark days may dawn, but don't give up on yourself. Keep on striving, struggling. No, many, no matter how many times you falter, get up. Don't give up. No matter how many times you fail, remember God hasn't given up on you. Tell yourself no matter how fierce the battles, no matter how many times you've disappointed God, as long as there's a little fight left in you, you're going to pray that prayer at the cross. Lord, remember me. Through every tear you shed, through every sorrow you endure, through every trial you pass through, pray that prayer. Lord, remember me. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Is there somebody here who knows that you've failed the Lord? Is some preacher in here knows that you've failed the Lord? Some elder, some deacon?
and you want to hear God say to you, have no fear. You will be with me in paradise. And today you want to claim that promise. You want to claim it by faith. And you want to say, Lord, remember me. I'm going to invite you where you are. Just stand on your feet. If you want to pray that prayer, Lord, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. He came to pay a debt that we didn't couldn't pay Lord remember me someone said at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light the burdens of my heart were rolled away Lord remember me God has asked me to do something. Is there anybody here who plans to be baptized today? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm going to be baptized today. I want you to slip out of the aisle. I want you to come on down here to the altar. Those of you who are going to be baptized today, we're going to have a special word of prayer for you. And if there's anybody else here who knows you need to be baptized, you don't have your robe yet, you can get one. We'll get one for you. You come on. I need to be baptized today. I am that thief who's praying, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, you know, we should be shouting in this church. We, we don't understand we really don't understand that these folks are here because Jesus on Calvary said not guilty somebody say hallelujah for these folks who come here today hallelujah Come on, choir, sing it. Sing it, choir. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Jesus. When the Calvary saved a wretch like you and me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's love. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, choir, sing it all like you made it. Like you and me, that's the best love. Yeah, 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 that's love. Somebody say that's love. Oh, Calvary, oh, Santa Rich, like you and me. Pastor, will you come here? We're going to have a baptism right after this service. Did you know that? Hallelujah! At the cross, at the cross. Somebody going to leave here every day, pray that prayer. Lord, remember me. You can pray in a different way. Lord, I need you. Lord, keep me. Lord, help me. Don't let me fail you. Whatever way you have to pray it, you can pray in your own way, but pray that prayer every day. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Pastor, pray for these folks who come to be baptized today. God has spoken. Let the church say amen.
going to do as Pastor Phipps has instructed, but as your heads are bowed, as your eyes are closed, there's still somebody. You're standing, you're watching, and you know you need to be a part of this number. In the name of Jesus. Jesus.